Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. This short screencast just walks through our midterm exam. I'm going to read the questions and offer some notes and suggestions that should help put your mind at ease as you work. To start, I've just put some reminders here at the top. You have until February 15 to do this, 9.45 a.m. Pacific as usual. We're allowing you to use the standard grace period of two days, but there are no extensions after that, and the 2% deductions per day that apply for assignments that are late do not apply here. Another way this is unlike a regular assignment is that you need to do this work on your own. It's open notes, open book, open web, this is all fine, but no collaboration with other students. In addition, if you have questions, please post them on the ed form or write to the staff email address. Questions sent to individual instructors probably won't be answered in a timely enough fashion to be useful. And I will say that I'm actually going to discourage the team from responding to messages sent directly to them individually, because it's important that we as a teaching team have consistent policies on what kind of help we provide and how we're communicating about exam questions. In that same spirit, if you do post on the ed forum, please try not to give away answers since this is meant to be individual work. Okay, that's it for the policies, I think. Let's dive into the questions. Question one, modifier diagnosis, worth two points. The task, classify the modifier faulty, as in faulty keyboard, as intersective, subsective, non-subsective, or privative, according to the typology developed by Partee 1995, and provide justification for your classification. That's the core of it. Let me single out this sentence here. Provide the most restrictive classification you can. You'll recall that some classifications entail some others, so we want to see the strongest or most restrictive classifications possible, given the logic of the categories. Finally, and this is vital, our evaluation will not focus on your linguistic judgments, which are entirely your own in the Jack and Dolph sense. Rather, we'll focus on how you reason in terms of your reported intuitions and the partee adjective classes. For example, I think we can all agree that the adjective alleged is non-subsective. However, if this question were about alleged and someone said alleged was privative because for all ends, alleged ends are not ends, well, we might worry about this person's ability to understand English texts that involve alleged, uh, but we can at least see that they're reasoning about the categories correctly, and that's really all we care about. Still, we're curious to see what examples and intuitions you have about faulty, so we'd of course prefer some solid and genuine examples and judgments. Question two, novel compounds, worth two points. In Levine et al.'s free response comprehension experiment, 19 of 20 responses for salad glove were coded as purpose. The one other response was color. Is this expected under their account? Say why or why not. In writing your answer, make sure to first classify the modifier, the head, and the compound itself as artifact or natural kind. And second, make sure to make meaningful use of the relevant core hypothesis from their paper. We say three to four sentences should suffice. Okay, just note first there are two parts here. The first is fairly mechanical, and it would be a shame to overlook it and therefore lose a bunch of credit. For the second part, I would say that the crucial thing is to clearly connect with the relevant hypothesis from the paper. Weaker answers will tend to do this vaguely, whereas strong answers are going to be really explicit and direct about the connections. It might help you to have in mind a reader for your answer who isn't familiar with the paper, so that you push yourself to be explicit about the reasoning and the hypotheses and so forth. I would add that there's some nuance to this question. Is this expected under their account? This turns somewhat on how you interpret their hypotheses. I myself pushed for a relaxed view of the hypotheses in the paper, one that allows for some surprising variation. And I think that's the correct reading of the paper and the evidence, but reasonable people could differ somewhat. So the crucial thing is, again, to try to be very clear about your conclusions and the rationale for them. Question three, function application, were three points. Reduce the following expressions by applying the necessary application and substitution steps. You should reduce the expressions as far as possible, including sub-expressions. 
I hope this one is a chance to get three points pretty easily. These are all mechanical operations. With gout getting into specifics, I'll just offer some general tips. First, when you apply a function to an argument, be sure to knock off the outermost lambda and only that one. Second, be sure to change all occurrences of the target variable to the argument. Third, don't be afraid if lambdas linger. A common source of errors is for students to assume that every operation will get rid of all the lambdas, when in fact there might not be enough arguments for that. Fourth, do make sure you perform all necessary lambda conversions. There can be internal sub-expressions that have lambdas that can be knocked out, and you'll lose some credit if you overlook such conversions. Question four, quantificational determiner, worth two points. I'm not trying to be tricky here. I expect this to be easy. The answer looks a lot like a number of semantically similar cases from section three of the quantifier properties handout. Look those up. Just remember your cardinality brackets and make sure you're making use of the framework we offered here. Question five, compositional analysis, worth two points. The instructions here are identical to those from assignment three, question one. Again, no tricks and the same standards that we used for that assignment. This should be straightforward. If you feel uncertain though about our expectations and standards, then work through a similar problem or two with a teaching team member. We won't talk about these trees from the midterm, but we'll talk about literally any others that don't contain them. So there's a wide space to do interesting hands-on problem solving that will serve your goals for the midterm. Question six, a non-existent, non-conservative determiner, worth two points. This has exactly the same set of requirements as assignment four, question three. I literally just changed the determiner meeting. Consider the hypothetical quantificational determiner that I suppose I'll pronounce Laroff. Show that this hypothetical determiner is not conservative. To do this, you just need to find a counterexample, sets A and B that fail the conservativity test when given as arguments to Laroff, and explain why these sets constitute a counterexample. Please do not give your argument in terms of English sentences. Since Laroff is not a real determiner, such sentences don't make sense and so cannot carry the argument. Again, no tricks here. We work through things like this in class, and I have a handout, some formal analyses of determiners, where a model answer is given for a different imaginary determiner, some non. One tip I'll offer here uh, for you kind and attentive viewers, remember that you need only see a failure of entailment in one direction for the two directions that are relevant for conservativity. So don't stop if you see one entailment that holds. Check the other way. <laughs> That's crucial here. Last question, question seven, wherever can appear, worth two points. I'm hoping that this is an empirically engaging question. The English adverbial particle ever has a highly restricted distribution. On the basis of the following examples where the asterisk marks ungrammatical cases as usual, formulate a generalization in terms of the monotonicity properties of determiners about wherever can appear. And then you see we have this paradigm here. And then I've given some tips. Please restrict your attention to this set of examples when formulating your generalization and accept the grammaticality judgments as given, even if you disagree with them. So this means you don't have to have clear intuitions or share my intuitions. You can treat this paradigm as a puzzling paradigm from a foreign language if you like. Second, I've used square bracketing to indicate the basic syntactic structure of these cases. In all cases, the string inside the NP brackets corresponds to the restriction of the determiner, semantically, and the string inside the VP brackets corresponds to the scope of the determiner, semantically. You should think of the restriction and scope as creating environments, and we're figuring out whether ever can occur inside those environments or not. Now, all you have to do is provide the generalization. However, I encourage you to work as follows. Figure out the monotonicity properties of these determiners, both first and second arguments. Maybe make a chart. And then study how the chart aligns with the distribution of ever. This should reveal a nice and neat generalization. Having done this work, I'd suggest that you include that chart and perhaps explain it a bit. That way, a mistake in your generalization can still earn partial credit. 
If you just give us a wrong generalization with no explanation, there isn't much we can do except give you no credit. But seeing your reasoning in terms of that chart might show us a lot of things that are deserving of some real credit. Okay, that's it. Uh, as I promised, this is meant to be a bunch of pretty lightweight assignment style questions. It touches on previous concepts in largely familiar ways, just as a midterm like this should, I believe. Okay, and do let us know if anything else should be further clarified. Thanks so much.